the filmmaker who brought us the teen slasher horror flick, I Know What You Did Last Summer, had a very specific vision for his film. He wanted a well-crafted, thrilling, nicely paced story that will hook audiences from the first scene. And he got what he wanted. It's true. Yeah. This director also wanted a hot, young, fresh, talented cast of up-and-coming superstars to bring this terrifying tale to life. And he got what he wanted. Well, except for Freddie Prince Jr. You are not gonna throw this on me! That's right, the guy who made I Know What You Did Last Summer was very open about how he did not want this silly pretty man in his movie. You! Shut up! Just shut up! Christ already, I'll do it! And this director constantly harassed poor Freddy on set, just out of spite. Yeah, every day. That director let this young actor know that he was not good enough for his perfect little horror teen slasher movie. And this was Freddy's first film. The hate that this filmmaker had for this young prince was so intense that he even tricked Freddy into doing a dangerous boating stunt, which almost killed him. We do the rehearsal and the boat is not safe to do this jump and I fly out of the boat and it goes right over my head, the outboard engine. And I can feel, I don't know how close it was, but it felt like it was a millimeter away. This dude, Freddie Prince Jr., was making a movie about a crazy fisherman trying to kill him while having to worry about a crazy filmmaker trying to kill him. Allegedly, not like on purpose, you, you know. You're gonna die. Wait, wait, stop it! But Freddie Prince Jr. never gave up and delivered a fine performance that helped the teen slasher genre grow, helped it continue on for a few years. You know how the ladies are called scream queens? Well, this he's like a scream king, scream prom king. But yeah, the type of stuff that Freddie Prince Jr. had to go through on the set of I Know What You Did Last Summer is the kind of stuff that Hollywood has been throwing at poor Freddie since the beginning. And despite of all that, Freddie Prince Jr. still made a name for himself. But in recent years, it feels like we have been seeing his name on fewer and fewer film projects. I think Scooby-Doo 2 was his last big leading role, I think. And that was in 2004, which if you can do the math, that's like a lot of years. So let's find out just what the f happened to Freddie Prince Jr. But to truly understand what the f happened to Freddie Prince Jr., we must begin at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1976, Los Angeles, California. He grew up loving Scooby-Doo, pro wrestling, and Star Wars. And of course, you cannot be a junior without the senior, which means Freddie Prince Jr. was the son of groundbreaking comedian Freddie Prince who tragically committed suicide at just 22 years old, before his son was even a year old. I could never figure out how my parents met, a gypsy and a Puerto Rican. I asked my mother, she said they're on the subway trying to pick each other's pocket. <laughs> Freddie Prince Jr. was inspired to get into show business as a teen to continue the legacy of his father. Yeah, prophecy fulfilled, right? To become my father. Freddie Prince Jr. would get small roles in to Jillian on her 37th birthday in 1996 and The House of Yes in 1997, along with some one-offs on shows Family Matters and ABC After School Special. Freddie Prince Jr. was then cast opposite other poster-friendly faces in 1997's I Know What You Did Last Summer. I Know What You Did Last Summer? Ooh! What a crock of shit. He was cast for his everyman quality, even though, like I said, the director hated the casting of, of this young actor. But I Know What You Did Last Summer was his breakout role, nabbing him a Blockbuster Entertainment Award nomination, which is about the highest accolade he could ever get as an actor which is pretty damn good. Way to go, Freddy. And like I said, the director was very clear and open that he did not want Freddy in his gosh darn movie. 
which, like I said, almost killed poor Freddy. But Freddy Prince Jr. would survive this horrible production and survive the movie, spoiler alert, which allowed him to go on to star in 1998's sequel, I still know what you did last summer. Shit! Which was another teen horror hit. Hooray. But yeah, seriously, these movies are actually pretty good. Great cast, there's some good suspense, and you know, it makes you think about what is right and what is wrong, and don't f with fishermen. And don't drink and drive, and don't throw bodies away. Especially if they're not dead. Everybody can learn a lesson from this movie. It's a fictional story created to warn young girls of the dangers of having premarital sex. Then Freddie Prince Jr. would enter into the world of teen romantic comedies, also called teen rom-coms, because that was the cool thing to do at that time, if you were a cool teen. I have 2,000 girls in this school and I could bum monkeys with every one of them. He was cast in She's All That, written by M. Night Shyamalan, that's not a joke. And Freddie Prince Jr. had so much charm on screen, and he had so much charisma that the script was actually reworked to better fit the actor. I was busy. Yeah, busy wigging. Excuse me, I did not wig. There was major wiggage. And yeah, he too is charming, even though this movie's kind of weird, but hey, f you know, he's good. You forgive him for all the horrible things, and you just say, okay, Freddie, it's the 90s, who cares? What I do. She's All That also showed how much chemistry he could have with his co-stars, whether it be romantically or just friends. Like his chemistry with Matthew Lillard. I can get you an introduction, or maybe an autograph. No, that's okay. It's here in this movie. Look at all that chemistry all over the place. Oh my gosh, chemistry. Again, the Blockbuster Entertainment Awards would bow to Freddy, who became a mainstay at those low-level pop award shows. You know, like MTV or the Teen Choice Awards. You could always see Freddy there. Good for him. Maybe. And like I said, Freddy Prince Jr. was so good that they changed the script of She's All That because he was all that. But script changes didn't always work to his advantage. Like when Wing Commander crashed and burned. So, tell me the truth. How bad did I suck? You were good. I'm sure it was a pretty good script, and then they're like, let's make this a little more Freddy Prince Jr. y and Matthew Lillard y. Is he in this one too? You listen to me. Don't you ever play that stupid game with me. You hear me? Wing Commander was the first flop of his career. And Freddie Prince Jr. said that he can't stand this movie one bit. But yeah, on paper, Wing Commander should have been his Top Gun. You know, it should have made him one of the most biggest, most on-demand actors at that time. Leading a sci-fi epic? But no. Wing Commander showed us that anything is possible. I don't have the faith. And then came the year 2000, which saw two more genuinely idiotic throwaways. The widely panned Down to You, which was basically just riding off that She's All That popularity, and the film Boys and Girls, which he starred alongside Jason Biggs. What the f happened to him? Hey, you were a loser, weren't you? Or dude, you rocked in Boys and Girls. No, it always comes back to that fucking pie. It was at this point that Freddie Prince Jr. tried to break from his mold a bit, using the movie Boys and Girls as a way to transition into more serious, dramatic material. Because Boys and Girls, it seems like it's just like a teen romantic comedy thing, which it is, but it also has a little more edge to it because Freddy couldn't just go on full drama. He had to be like, I have to do a teen rom-com that has a little bit of drama, and then I can do more drama because that's the way things work, apparently. That's dumb. Yeah, well, you're pretty dumb. But yeah, speaking of serious, darker material, let's talk Batman. I'm Batman. That's right, if Boys and Girls was more of a success, he would have had a major boost and that would have given Warner Brothers more confidence in him because they were considering casting Freddie Prince Jr. as Batman, back when Darren Aronofsky was attached to direct. This was like pre-Christopher Nolan days. 
And yeah, my curious mind would have loved to see Freddie Prince Jr. become the Dark Knight, but I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. The boy's too skinny. If he put on some muscle, maybe, does he have the chin? That's all that really matters, actually. Man does have a point. I don't know. I believe that everything happens for a reason, and there are lots of reasons why Freddie Prince Jr. shouldn't play Batman. This is such an intense subject for me. So after they passed him up on Batman, Freddie Prince Jr. again attempted to transition into more adult characters, like in 2001's Head Over Heels, where he plays a guy who may or may not be a murderer. She's a black belt in karate. <laughs> hey, me too. <laughs> But he still always had that doofy, sort of handsome guy who doesn't really know what's going on kind of thing, but it doesn't matter because he's so good looking kind of thing. Sure, we can all relate to that. Oh, please. What? Still couldn't really break out of that type of character, but at least this one had killer edge to it. Next, Freddie Prince Jr. would team up with Matthew Lillard again for a movie that's kind of lame, but it's innocent enough. Summer Catch, opposite Jessica Biel. And I'm sure everybody was like, Hey, Freddie Prince Jr., I know what you did last summer, catch. I'm staying here. No, I'm dressed for practice. I'm staying here tonight. I can't be late, yo. Once again, I'm sure everybody thought this movie was gonna boost his star, but it, it, it didn't. This baseball movie was not a home run. 2002 was a banner year for Freddie Prince Jr., with the most notable and tabloid hungry event, marrying Sarah Michelle Gellar who he met on the set of I Know What You Did Last Summer. And yeah, you could always feel the love and chemistry between Freddie Prince and Sarah Michelle in I Know What You Did Last Summer, even though their characters were not romantically connected. She was with Ryan Felipe, and he was with Jennifer Love Hewitt, but still, love conquers all. We don't need luck. We have a very strong relationship. We weren't together over the summer, and everything was fine. And a person who does not believe in love conquering all is Howard Stern, because he predicted, incorrectly, that their marriage would not last. Because most Hollywood marriages don't. But Howard Stern believed this one wouldn't last so much that he put one million dollars into it. And considering their marriage has gone on for 20 years or so, Howard better cough up that money. Cause true love conquers all! And we want to talk to you about something affecting millions of households, a topic we care passionately about. Doing it every night. That year of 2002 would also be the release of Scooby-Doo, starring Freddy as Fred. Look, I'm a man of substance. The dorky chicks like you turn me on too. Alongside, yet again, Matthew Lillard. It's plastic! What do you care you drink out of a toilet? So do you! And Sarah Michelle Geller. So you told me not to go up to the castle, so I would think that you wanted me to go, so I wouldn't go, just like you didn't want me to. And this time, the script actually made Fred and Daphne a couple for the first time because the actors were a couple in real life, so why not? And we all just assumed that Fred and Daphne had something going on. Hey. I can look at myself naked. Oh, brother. But yeah, Freddy was born to play Fred. As a lifelong fan of Scooby-Doo, he knew everything about the series. And I believe he had a massive Scooby-Doo collection. Like he owned every episode on tape or something before being cast. That's what kind of a nerd he is. I think these are just rumors, I think but I believe them all. So yeah, his heart and his soul was in this intellectual property. Freddy delivers a goofy and charming performance that hits the tone perfectly, no matter what the Razzie nominations say. He even reprised the role on Robot Chicken. And this Scooby-Doo movie, it nabbed an astonishing $275 million worldwide. And I think it was written by James Gunn, right? I'm not exactly the biggest fan of these Scooby-Doo movies, but I do think the cast is perfect. And as the years have gone by, it seems like a lot of people have some mega nostalgia for this movie. It really seemed to touch people. And I think a lot of that is because of Freddy and his blonde hair, which, you know, it's totally, it works, because it's like, it's like, he looks like a cartoon character, but, you know, he's supposed to because he is. Fritz has got his groove on. 
And yeah, like I said, this one was a mega success, and it spawned a sequel, Scooby-Doo Monsters Unleashed, which is another kind of cult favorite. They really get to play around with these characters, and you know what? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a creative, interesting risk they took here that still stays true to the heart of Scooby-Doo. The people of Coolsville are the best in the world! Freddie Prince had a short stint on Boston Legal, which did allow him to practice his dramatic chops, and yeah, his dramatic chops, they chop well. This was followed by the straight-to-video film Shooting Gallery, and in 2005, Freddie Prince Jr. got his own show, ABC's Freddy! He played a guy named Freddy. It was a nice, fun little show. Unfortunately, it only lasted one season. But through this television sitcom show, it did seem to bring a link to his father, who, of course, was on the hit show Chico and the Man. So it was nice to see another Freddie Prince on TV. I know your dad is proud, Freddie. I'm learning about TV. Then this man took to voice work like in a movie called Shark Bait, which was just trying to ride that Finding Nemo shark tail wave, and a movie called Happily Never After, both of which showed that whether the movie was good or not, Prince is a terrific voice actor. The year 2007 brought forgettable New York-centric fare, like a movie called Brooklyn Rules, and a movie called New York City Serenade. His career was on a downslide and going fast. 2006 was another lousy year for Freddie Prince Jr., with a movie called Jack and Jill vs. the World, which was incredibly sappy. I could barely sit through the trailer. And a movie called Delgo, which had the worst opening ever of all time. Some reports said that there were only two viewers per screen on opening weekend. Delgo is so bad and so forgettable that it's not even remembered for being a punchline. You know, like a Geely or a Battlefield Earth or something? Nobody's like, oh my god, that's like so bad, it's like Delgo. That's how bad Delgo is. It's so bad that people don't even know it exists. Ah! <laughs> But let's start that up. Whenever somebody's doing something like stupid or bad, just be like, oh my god, that's such a Delgo. Or you're such a Delgo. Stop Delgoing around, y'all. Oh, hell no, you Delgo. Something like that. I don't know. It was around this time that Freddie Prince Jr. had a shocking, surprising shift in career. He started working on WWE's creative team. Because just like with Scooby Doo, he was a lifelong professional wrestling fan, and he knew everything about the art of professional wrestling. He understood the showmanship, he respected the history, he actually did a really good job. He ended his time with the WWE because he wanted to focus on being a dad. So he kind of stepped away from all things entertainment in general, and that may have also had to do with working with Kiefer Sutherland. That's right, I don't know if you remember, but Freddie Prince appears on season 8 of the show 24, and Freddie said that working with Kiefer Sutherland was terrible, and he was the most unprofessional dude in the world. Probably because he was still in character as Jack Bauer. You have to forgive him, man. And since Freddy is such a wrestling fan, I say we settle this in a steel cage. Freddy vs. Kiefer. But despite all the onset drama, Freddy Prince Jr. is pretty dang good in 24. And it's actually very refreshing to see him in such a role. Freddy Prince Jr.'s time on screen was becoming limited. Instead, he would mostly continue with voice roles, as in 2012's Mass Effect Paragon Lost, and for the animated series Star Wars Rebels from 2014 to 2018. I mean, just the time period they put us in is so rewarding for fans of this franchise. It puts you right where you want to be, and I never expected it in a million years. He later had a small bit in 2019's Star Wars Rise of Skywalker, and yeah, it's a dream for many actors to be a part of the Star Wars universe. At least it used to be. But this dream of being in Star Wars kind of ended up being a nightmare to Freddie Prince, who faced off against Toxic fans. What? Star Wars fans are toxic? I'm shocked. 
These are George Lucas's words, not mine. So fuck you if you disagree with me. <laughs> straight, straight up, this is information, not affirmation time. Straight up, man. Freddie Prince Jr. would slam these particular fans for their video game mentality to the universe of Star Wars. And he said that some of them suffer from fan entitlement syndrome. Are you suffering from fan entitlement syndrome? Comment your comment in the comments below. But yeah, Freddie Prince Jr. is very vocal about his disagreements and others misunderstanding things in the Star Wars fandom. And yeah, he is not afraid to speak his mind when it comes to Star Wars. He's all like, shut up, you midichlorians, and you're gonna, bleh, the force, you don't even stand the force, you're toxic. He showed them. As of late, the actor co-starred in the Punky Brewster reboot, playing Punky's ex-husband. He had a cameo in Clerks 3, and he headlined the Netflix Christmas movie called A Christmas With You. And Christmas With You is his first starring role since like 2008. And he wrote a cookbook in 2016 because apparently he does all the cooking at home. And apparently his wife does all the vampire slaying at home, I guess. And who is he now? He's a father. He's a wrestling fan. And he's a podcaster. In 2021, he launched a podcast called Wrestling with Freddy, where he talks about wrestling. And he hosts a series called WWE Rivals. But good on him. Sure, the roles that Hollywood offered him kind of limited him as a performer, and we never really got to see how far he could shine, I think. But you know what? That doesn't really matter, because he shined in his own way, and it's so bright and special. I, yeah, I guess. But as a person, Freddie Prince Jr. has shown more interest and passion for life and just doing what brings him joy, that I kind of like this new Freddie Prince Jr. He's just like, yeah, I did my Hollywood thing now. I'm just like a cool dad who likes wrestling and Star Wars. Uh, huh, huh. He's a he's a f***ing nerd. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm getting ready to play some Sega. No, you're not. Well, I believe I was invited. I am uninviting you. Whether he's bringing his favorite cartoon to life or being a part of the WWE or raising a family and staying married to your wife, <laughs> which is apparently impossible in the land of Hollywood land. But Freddie Prince does it all and he he, he does it good. So yeah, good for them, good for Freddy, good for Sarah Michelle Gellar, good for their kids, and good for the whole gang Scooby-Doo people. They seem to really have a fairy tale happy ending. That isn't over yet. And this prince rules his kingdom with nothing but love. Freddy Prince Jr. seems to be content with his place in cinema history, and he should be. And so nobody should give a f about what the f happened to Freddy Prince Jr. Because he's doing just fine.